I'm a preacher, so I, bar- I brought what I do with me, if you don't mind. And if you don't have one, I got you covered. Um, they asked me to come and to, and to speak and to preach for the next 29 minutes. Before I do that, I want to say what an honor it is to be here and how much I appreciate and honor Charlie and this amazing team, his precious wife, the price that they pay, the, the constant. Um, he amazes me, his ability to take a stand and go into places that nobody else goes. And so when they ask me, I could not turn this one down because I believe it's important. And to be able to address pastors and church leaders particularly, I'm honored to be here. A good lawyer will keep you uh, a, good, a good doctor will keep you out of the hospital. A good lawyer will keep you out of jail. And a good preacher will keep you out of hell. And uh, I hope that we all end up being great preachers in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And I want to just give a thought here today because... Uh, if ever there was a time where we have to be challenged as ministers. I've been pastoring, if you don't know who I am, I've been pastoring for over 30 years, the same church. I got involved uh, heavily uh, about eight years ago in the affairs of um, what was taking place in our nation because I felt like that if I didn't, we were at a crossroads And any influence and any voice that God had given me, I had to stand up and preach the truth. And I want to show you why that's important for just a moment. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and I want to read verse 19. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears... But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's tools, plowshares and axes and sickles. And it says in verse 22, So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in their hand of any of the people they were there except for Saul and Jonathan his son. I read this text some time ago and I was thinking about where we are as a nation and particularly concerning being a pastor. The nation of Israel was invaded by the Philistines. They were completely under siege. The first thing they did was take their weapons. The first thing they did was to not allow them to have physical weapons and of course as I refer to weapons here I'm not talking although I'm a big Second Amendment guy I'm not talking just about that I'm talking about specifically spiritual warfare and it's interesting that the text begins by saying there were no blacksmiths in Israel I think that it's become fashionable in the American church particularly The past several years, I've watched a trend where it's a me-centered gospel where we are not really doing what God has called us to do. If there's no blacksmiths, then guess what? If there's no blacksmiths in Israel, there are no weapons being produced. Therefore, the people don't have on the whole armor of God. I think that it's been fashionable to preach a lot about self-esteem, and I understand that. Again, I'm a pastor. People need to be built up. But at some point, when you see a nation being overtaken with evil, we must open up the blacksmith shop again. We must, we must get to a point that we understand that we cannot take the pain out of Christianity. We can't take the shortcuts anymore. We can't 
We can't microwave produce real Christians who will take a stand and fight for what is right. You can microwave a potato, but you cannot microwave a Christian. You have to open up the blacksmith shop. And the Bible said, because there were no blacksmiths, notice this, there were no weapons in Israel. The only one who had a weapon was Jonathan and Saul, the king and the king's son. Nobody else even had a weapon. They had to submit in every area of their life to those who had overtaken them. And the reason was not because the enemy was so powerful. The reason was because the blacksmith shops were shut down. I believe it's a picture of the ministry. I believe it is the picture of pulpits in America. Because as the pulpits go, so the nation goes. If we don't open up the blacksmith shop again, what does that mean? In America today, it's amazing that there are not many strong preachers. But I'm encouraged through this great conference. Because what we're calling for, what the times is calling for, what the kingdom of heaven is calling for. And you know, I'm trying to behave because there, a teacher tells it and a preacher yells it. And unfortunately, I'm a little of both. So I'll try to be calm for all of you. But, uh, but, but they did invite me to preach. And uh, that's about all I'm good for. But in America today, it's amazing how few strong preachers I hear. I mean, men and women of God who point their fingers at the sin of America and say, let's turn it around. We're not here just to curse the darkness. We're here to turn on the light. We're here to open up the blacksmith shop. There's a shortage of strong preachers and strong pastors and strong Christians who don't backslide, who don't compromise, who are not for sale, who do not water down the message. You cannot, you cannot put tampered steel into existence without the heat of the furnace and the pounding of the hammer which is the Word of God that breaks to pieces every resistance that comes against it. We need, again, the hammer of the Word of God that when lies come in our culture, in our schools, concerning every issue that we've heard so much wonderful talk about, and I don't have to name them, but what we have to do is we have to open up the blacksmith shop again. And get the furnace to burning until the Word of God is like a fire shut up in our bones. And if that means I need to change my sermon series because something current in the news needs to be addressed by the hammer and by the furnace, we must be led by the Spirit again. And if you can't give me a Pentecostal amen, I'll take a Baptist nod right now. Come on. I'll take a Presbyterian raised eyebrow. I'll, I'll take a Catholic crucifix, but everybody who names the name of Jesus, it's all hands on deck. It's time to open up the blacksmith shop. Sit down. You're shouting on my time. We got to get the heat of the furnace back. We've got to get locked up with the Lord and, and come out like fire shut up in our bones and speak because head talks to head. But heart, a heart on fire when they walked with Jesus after the resurrection. The Bible said, they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he spake? They got holy heartburn. The doctrine of the furnace has been, obliv has been obliterated from, from the kingdom and from the church. Messages, and I'm not a preacher basher. I know how hard it is. But we, I mean, America is, is dying on the vine and it seems like our sermons are so out of touch 
and I see, I see school boards fighting and standing up. I see college students fighting and standing up. I see all kinds of people in politics standing up. I see business people standing up. But the pulpits think that we have to just go along and be nicey-nicey and get along with everybody. And I'm all for love, but we must speak the truth in love. If we're not careful, we want the approval of men more than we want the approval of God. And we want what sells books and draws people. How to sermon titles. How seven ways to improve your vacation this summer. How to quadruple your salary by five o'clock this afternoon. You're a winner seminar. I want to hear something about the glory of God. I want to hear something about the truth of God's Word. I want to hear something that convicts me. You shouldn't just go to church and always feel good. Sometimes your toes need to get st stamped on. Sometimes you need to leave there saying, I feel convicted. We've got to get morality and moderation back in people who call themselves Christian. That only happens when you open up the blacksmith shop and you get the furnace of the Holy Spirit to burning and the hammer of God's Word to preaching something that is right where people live. The blacksmith shop was closed. And I'm just being honest. In my day as I was coming up, and I'm older than most of you here probably, I'm 60 years old, but we had people, we had people like Chuck Colson. We had people like Billy Graham. It was not an uncertain signal that came from the pulpit. It was a furnace. It was absolutely shaping and putting in the hands of people the weapon of the sword of the Spirit that when they left those crusades, when they left, well, I, I listened to people even like Jerry Falwell who shaped my life because they would stand up and address the condition of America concerning abortion, concerning gay marriage, concerning all of these other issues. And, and they did it in a way that caused us to have clarity. We knew what we believed and our people knew and our children knew and our young people knew. And I'm sorry, but if the pulpit, as the pulpit goes, the nation goes. We've got Christians today, and thank God for it, who have better cars, better clothes, better homes. But there's a hollowness on the inside because we need revival to hit our pulpits. The Bible said God took of Moses' spirit and he put it on the 70 elders. I want to ask you a question I ask myself a lot. Could God, could God take my spirit and put it, is it safe for God to take my spirit and put it on my people because you reproduce after your kind? I want to be bold in this hour. I want to stand up and I want to proclaim the Word of God and I want the hammer of the Word to form swords in the hands of a new generation. I'm not ready to just get up and criticize the young people. I believe they're the greatest generation. They have technology. They have knowledge. All they need is a sword in their hand and it's going to require us to open back up the blacksmith. Don't get up and worry about what people say. Preach the Word. The Bible says. The Bible says how do you feel about gay marriage the Bible says how do you feel about abortion the Bible says how do you feel about corruption the Bible says the Bible says the Bible says everybody take a praise break praise the Lord watch out you might start a fire I want you to notice something else about this text that is so important. Not only was the blacksmith shop closed, no fire, 
and no hammer. I mean, where's modesty going? Can we never speak about anything anymore? Can we not preach anything that's controversial? I, I, I still believe in modesty. I still believe that, that if, you, if you're a young teenage girl or, or a mother and you go to the beach, of course we're going to wear beach clothes, but I don't even know if our young people know where the line modesty is. If, if, if you have dental floss on as a bathing suit, and I'm just preaching to the men. I'll get to the women in just a moment. I, I'm just talking to the men in this place. Have you been to the beach lately? This is an indictment against the pulpit because somewhere we got to get down to those kinds of issues that virginity is still precious and powerful and that holiness is still God's standard and living right and being different is okay. <laughs> Open up the blacksmith shop. Call it like it is. I'm not going to give my teenager a condom and tell them to be safe. I'm going to tell them abstain from that until marriage. I'm going to teach them the truth of God's Word. The next thing the Bible says is because there were no blacksmiths in Israel, no preachers. You know what they did? The Jewish people went down, the Israelites went down to the Philistines' camp to get what they would use to equip the people. Pop psychology from the pulpit. Poems and stories. And I call them longhorn sermons. Two points and a lot of bull in between. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what my goal is when I walk up to a pulpit. My goal is to preach something that gets beyond the parking lot. That's my new goal. I, I redefine my whole ministry. Most of our sermons don't get past the parking lot. But if you preach a word from the Lord, you might forget a lot of things, but you're not going to forget the blacksmith shop right now. Not because I'm a great preacher, but because I heard from the Lord. I've only preached this on a Wednesday night one time, but the Lord said, go in there, and if you'll preach it, I'll back it up. How many pastors in this room want to open up a blacksmith shop in your church and in your ministry and in the families God has put you over? Stir it up, Lord. Stir up the gift that is within us. I don't want to hear about the complexity of the human personality. I want to hear about the glory of God. I want to hear about Jesus, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He's coming back again. There's a heaven, there's a hell, and you're on team heaven or team hell. And if you haven't chosen by default, you're on team hell. Let's tell it like it is. Let's quit. Let's quit. And I'm, that's not mean. That's not being ugly. And you say, well, you don't understand how to build a church. Well, you might ought to Google me. Because I can't, I can't. If you compromise, you're going to lose in this hour. But if you, people, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And they're looking for preachers who will stand up in love and use a lot of wisdom. And don't ever put, to be kind is to be holy. To be holy is to be kind. I, I preach like I preach but I'm kind to people. We can speak the truth with the wrong spirit. We can have a Mike Tyson spirit, you know, like Simon Peter had. He spoke the truth. And he, he was defending Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he pulled his sword off and cut the guy's ear off. All in the name of Jesus. You gotta you you can have the right you can have the right message in the wrong spirit. We gotta keep loving people. 
We've got to keep loving and showing people we love them, but we don't compromise. We want people at our table. We just don't want them to be able to change the menu. What we serve is what we serve. The Ten Commandments is what we serve. What the Bible says is what we serve. And we don't change the menu because Mr. Big Bucks is sitting there or this couple might write us up on, on Facebook or something. Just preach it. I'm trying to calm down. I'm almost done. I don't think we need... Our sermons to come from TED Talk anymore. I don't believe we need to stay so shallow with spiritual whipped cream when people are starving to death. I'm depressed as an adult because my mother drank too much coffee when I was a child. A compromising gospel. A humanistic gospel. I'm telling you that we're starting to see it. I don't want this to be a negative because I'm not a negative preacher. But when I watched Ashbury and when I see gatherings like this, I feel like that God is about to suddenly, like on the day of Pentecost, send a mighty rushing wind to His church, the breath of God. And there's going to be an army like Ezekiel saw, that begins to unify. We no longer have the luxury of disunity. I don't have to agree with you. We're fighting for our schools. We're fighting for our children and our grandchildren. I cannot allow some doctrinal thing. If you say Jesus is Lord, I, you, he was born of a virgin. He died on a cross for my sin. He rose on the third day. He's coming back again. I don't care if you're post-trib, pre-trib, post-weedies. I don't care we got to unify on something. Let's leave all our titles outside and come under one name, the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name that can fix this nation, the name that can heal our families, the name that can turn our nation around. Come on and praise that name with me one good time. Jesus, everybody shout his name. Jesus. I love him. I'm not crazy. I love him. Andre Crouch used to sing, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other, for Jesus is the way. The wheels are down, and I'm coming in for the landing. I want a gospel that breaks Satan's power off of a generation. I want a gospel that makes them throw their vapes down and say, I want to be free. Throw their marijuana down and say, I'm high on the most high. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather be. Uh, don't we need a revival like that that just shakes us? I believe it just starts with hunger. I want to be clean. I want to be holy. I believe America is longing for a meat and potatoes gospel. I'm from eastern North Carolina, born and raised and lived in a cornfield. And in eastern North Carolina, they have a, a marine base where they train fighter jet pilots. And if you're going those back country roads, it goes parallel with some of the landing strips where they're training those fighter jets. F-18, I guess it would be, or whatever it is they have now. And I love it because every once in a while they'll have billboards sponsored by the, by the Marines or whoever. And it, one of them that I read said, uh, it's pretty funny, you, 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 when, they, when those jets come down and they come over your car because they have to go, it will scare you to death if you don't see it coming. And one of the billboards said, pardon the noise. It's the sound of freedom. I hope that when you leave this conference, you have to put a sign out in your lobby of your church. Pardon the noise. 
inside you're about to hear the sound of freedom. Freedom, freedom, let freedom ring, spirit, soul, and body. I guess what I'm trying to preach is don't be afraid to talk about what everybody else refuses to talk about in your city. Talk about it. Give the instruction. Be bold. Talk about it. Talk about holiness. Holiness is not too much toe cleavage. (laughs) Holiness says God is worthy of our best. And we have, listen to this, we have nothing to apologize for. I said preachers, we have nothing to apologize for. We have watched them experiment on our children, experiment on our families, experiment on marriage, and it's left depressed, defeated, messed up lives in, in its in laying the, the bodies laying everywhere as a result, seven times more prone to commit suicide if you have surgery that changes your gender. That's a fact. Seven times more. We have nothing to apologize. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. Preach it. Preach it boldly. Open up. Open up. We need a sword to cut through the abortion obsession the homosexual obsession in America. We have rubber swords. And a rubber sword is you get the point, but it draws no blood. Open the furnace back up. Make it legal to pray all night if you, need, if you want to. Make it legal to call a fast in your church again. Open, open the... Open the the furnace back up. Make it legal to be criticized for your faith and acceptable and teach your people. Put a, put a sword in their hand, not a physical sword, a spiritual sword, which is the Word of God according to Ephesians chapter 6. So in closing, we've got to build the weapons and put the weapons in the hands of God's people again. Character, integrity, standing for what is right no matter what it costs. Do you receive that today? Can I pray for you in closing? You've been an amazing audience. Thank you. Lift your right hand. Lord, I pray for every person who's in this room and who's watching online. I pray for this organization, this great, really, it's a, it's a, in my mind, it's a ministry to the nation. I pray for Charlie and his precious wife. Pray for all of these amazing people behind the scenes. God, help us as pastors and pastors' wives and pastors' husbands. Help us to open back up the blacksmith shop and put and form with the hammer of your word and the furnace of your Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit and weapons. Where are the weapons of the mighty men? One text said... Lord, we want to say it's in this generation. This is the time, now is the place, and you are the one. In Jesus' mighty name. Give the Lord all the praise. Would you do that? God bless you. I love you, pastors. I love you.